Hello, and welcome to episode eight of SpartyCast. I am geeked, stoked, excited to chat with Scott Galloway today. I know of him through the Prof G podcast. I don't know how I came to that. I think I was somehow poking around medium.com and got pushed over to his um, blog, No Mercy, No Malice. Let me just show you, I was doing a little bit of reading up on Scott in advance. Oh, and he's jumping in. Um, so Scott is a professor at NY Stern. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur. He's got this podcast, this blog. We'll talk about that um, on the show, I guess. And he's popping in, so I'm just going to pause the recording. I am super stoked to be here with Scott Galloway. I've already did a brief introduction and I've put up a bunch of links to his websites, but welcome Scott. Um, thank you for being here. How, how's your day going? Uh, it's good to be here, Robbie. And my, my day's going great. I live in Florida and it's a spectacular day. So yeah, everything's good. Where are you? I am in the Bay Area in California. We are escaping the Michigan winter, spending our semester out here while I teach online because uh, like you talk about, coronavirus has been easy on on the fortunate few of us who work purely online. Yep, hundred percent. And you're an associate professor and AT and T scholar at Michigan State. I literally am pulling up your name as I had no idea what I was doing here at this moment. <laughs> and I generally have a rule that I say yes to every academic, and that's why I'm here. Wow, thank you. So uh, on one of your podcasts, I'm just going to tell the story that I wrote in my email. You yep. said, if you want someone's attention, write them a handwritten letter and invite them to talk with you, give you advice. I couldn't write you a handwritten letter, so I wrote you an email, which the subject was Ceci Nespa Un handwritten letter. Um, did you I like my joke? It. it was effective. Well, let me put it this way. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here, and I'm I'm an incredibly arrogant snob when it comes to my time around this stuff. So, it absolutely uh, it absolutely worked. So, thank you, know, you so much. Here. And uh, I think you have every right to be an arrogant snob, as you put it. Go on, because you are you you are everywhere. You're doing so many awesome things. Um, I don't. I was just telling Drew, who manages your manages your tech. We had this great conversation, so I understand a bit of how you produce the podcast, and that's one of my main. Uh, interest here as a media scholar is mm -hmm. how have you come to podcasting? How how did how do you manage? So we we know you started all these businesses. We know uh, you've got great insight about the financial world, serial entrepreneur. Um, but what about media? Like I don't mm -hmm. get that sense uh, from your podcast of how you approach your media strategy: the newsletter, the blog, the books, the podcast, guest appearances, new shows. What's mm -hmm. your strategy? Uh, well, my strategy is to make it such that to resist is futile, and that is, um, I spent a lot of time uh, creating awareness. I think of your life, your business as the marketing funnel, and the top of it is awareness. And there are some academics where their work is so genius and so rigorous that their their genius is just discovered and gets distributed on its own. You should assume you are not that person. That is 0.1% of the population of any of any field. I don't care if you're an artist. The most successful artists are the ones that uh, spend almost as much time marketing their work as actually producing it. And I'm a big, big believer in multi-channel media. I think if you hear someone on a podcast and you read their blog post, you're three times as likely to become engaged in that content. So, and I love media and as, if your job is quote unquote academic or thought leader, trying to figure out new forms or new mediums, whether it's TikTok or Twitter or podcasting or YouTube, I've done all of those things, signal that you get it. If you're just punching out peer review research and only ends up in academic journals, you're kind of saying to the world that, okay, I might understand business, but I don't really get it. And it being understanding how to communicate with a new generation of business leaders. And then more generally speaking, my kind of superpower is I've been able to attract and retain really talented people. And one of my favorite sayings is greatness is in the agency of others. You were speaking to Drew, who's sort of my tech and operations guy. I have sound editors. I have made a, a big personal investment myself. I have homes in New York and West Palm or Gulfstream, which is just south of Palm Beach. I've made 
what for me are staggering investments in a broadcast quality studio in both places. And I have sound engineers, animators. So multi-channel, embracing new mediums, uh, and then finding, if you can, and investing in great people because, uh, uh, you know, you're just, you're only as, I don't want to say you're good as your weakest link, but I'm outstanding at standing on the shoulders of other people and, and taking advantage of, of their skills. Um, so, so you've got the human capital around you and, and the, um, the financial investment. What about your time investment in terms of these different channels? Like mm -hmm. I've noticed synergies between what you've written in the blog post and what you're talking about on the podcast. I'm reading your post Corona book right now. Um, which of course <laughs> it's been a while since you wrote that, but, um, mm -hmm. but there's synergies there. So do you write at the same time as preparing for your podcast? Like how does that flow work? Yeah, I generally, um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of deadlines. I'm fundamentally a lazy person and I find that deadlines are really, uh, hugely beneficial for someone like me. And I have a team, it's Thursday. I write my blog posts Thursday night because I know Friday morning at 6 a.m., you know, Jason Staver is my editor in chief will wake up and start editing it. And that Catherine Dillon and their design team will start sketching out little, you know, not little, sketching out charts. And that if it's not done by noon, it's not gonna get out. So I find deadlines are really important, um, and every day I have kind of a deadline, whether it's doing a podcast or or writing something. I enjoy writing books. I've written three of those, and your publisher, once you cash the advance, they kind of put deadlines on you. So, um, But generally speaking, I kind of bucket my time into three areas, sort of teaching, um, uh, uh, media stuff, that's writing and videos. And then the third bucket is my startup section four. So I kind of three buckets and I, look, I like to, I like to work. I, I have kind of a, what I call a unhealthy, uh, an, an unhealthy need that's resulted in some positive externalities for relevance. Uh, it's something uh, other people's affirmation is really important to me. And so I want to be relevant. And fortunately that quest or that desire for relevance has resulted in a certain level of economic security but it, you know it's important for me to it's important for me to have other people see my work and love it and recognize it and so that uh, must have been at the forefront of your decision to get into teaching after you'd been an entrepreneur for some time right yeah i always knew i wanted to do that uh, originally i thought about getting a phd and but you know there's a conflict and that is i've always as much as i wanted teaching uh, I, more, I wanted money. Uh, I, I grew up, and, you know, people don't speak very openly about money, and I try to be open about it. Uh, I didn't grow up with a lot of money, and it was very important to me. And so I decided at a very early age that I was going to pursue money, and that it was kind of my goal. And as a reward to myself, when I kind of hit a certain level of economic security, I said, okay, money is the ink in your pen, but it's not your story. What is my story? And I was thought, I, I would really like to teach. I think I'd be good at it and joined the faculty of NYU, gosh, about 20 years ago now. And it's kind, of, it's kind of the thing I know, or I think I know I'll be doing the rest of my life, and sort of my, you know, it's my home, or my ground zero, or, you know, the place I return to is always yeah. uh, uh, teaching, if you will. And you you're a professor as well, right? You're an associate professor? Associate at... professor, yeah. So uh, I actually considered uh, doing the entrepreneurial track and then i just yep. fell in love with academia loved research it's entrepreneurial on its own uh I do you have a doctorate a doctorate yeah. robbie yeah yeah and where did you and, study what's your kind of area uh so stanford undergrad and masters and then i went to annenberg school for communication yep. at usc, at USC um, yeah. so your rival over there yep. <laughs> in both Great schools school. Um, and I study video games virtual worlds and so that oh, great nice. segue because I want to know um what your latest thoughts are, you've talked about in the podcast, video games, yeah. gamification, virtual yeah. goods, crypto, NFTs, the future of these kind of industries coming together and then pr uh, proliferating into any sort of tokenized item. So what can, uh, and, and you often talk about the financial approach to these topics and learning from these media industries. But what about people in my field who might listen here who know a lot mm -hmm. about media and the psychology of media effects? Mm -hmm. How can I uh, help bridge to the, the crypto side, the NFT side? How can we take what we know about games and gamification and kind of meet you and, and your posse uh, in the middle? 
Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. So first off, I would imagine your classes and your domain expertise are in great demand right now because relative to the attention it gets or the the relationship let me back up the ratio of attention and coverage to the economic value of a sector video games get less coverage than any sector we obsess over domestic box office receipts i can take godzilla versus versus kong got did 53 million dollars last week on their opening weekend everybody knows that and quite frankly it really doesn't mean that much the entire Domestic box office in the U.S. is seven billion going to three or four. The video game business is twenty times that, and nobody knows, or I, I, other than if you're kind of really into games, what the sales are on the opening weekend of a game. So, and when you all you need to do to appreciate the size and the impact in the industry is just have sons. Uh, and in your industry, what I see is <clears throat> a few things happening. One dispersion right where it was sort of the movie studio model big big multi-million dollar or hundred several hundred million dollars of investments in a big game big burst release and then that dispersion where kind of roblox comes along and says we're going to pair creators with the end consumer and just create a platform and then let the consumer decide just as a TikTok consumer decides what videos they like and which videos they don't like uh, i see that as a big trend in your industry the idea of crypto, I think, in your business, uh, I would imagine there'll be some sort of NTFs, uh, or excuse me, NFTs around certain IP, although I don't think that'll be the real, real innovation is. I think you could see, you know, the most prolific or famous game developer issue a coin and say, if you own one of these coins, you have access to beta testing, our releases in perpetuity, special communities, you know, sort of hardcore gamer uh, coin from, I don't know if it's Activision, I, I, don't, I don't know the names of the, the big players here. But I think essentially crypto will, the next big uh, the next big revolution, if you will, will be its ability to credibly, credibly connote scarcity. And that is, I went on StockX to buy a PS5 because they have done a great job Sony's done a great job of creating artificial scarcity. And so once you know you can't get it, you become obsessed with it. And then you step in and then there's these bots that buy all the stuff from the, the, the typical channels, Amazon and Sony itself. And Sony likes that. Sony likes the, the artificial scarcity because it creates more and more demand. I've got to have it, right? That's the price. And I, and I wonder if a new way to monetize that scarcity will be to say, all right, this this company you either own we're going to limit it to a million coins and you either own a coin and it means you get the games early you get any game you want you get access to special events uh, and that's it we're not producing any more coins and we're going to create finite scarcity or we're only going to grow our customer base three or six percent a year i think that's the next big thing in what i would call ip uh or 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 assets that have some sort of scarcity value that they want to that they want to monetize okay interesting yeah um i think it it aligns very well with the virtual goods model the the v bucks and fortnite yeah. the the minecraft dollars whatever they're called well uh, let me, i, I want to put a question back to you because you're going to forget more about this and i'm going to know what do you think of epic games as an investment if you could if you could buy stock in epic uh, the North Carolina company right now, my understanding is they have Fortnite and they have a gaming platform, like, like a gaming development engine, I think. Mm -hmm. what, what, what are your thoughts on the prospects for Epic? Um, I think Epic's done a great job with Fortnite and they, they're they probably here to stay. They're probably working on other projects, but there are so many copycats in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to tell. At this point, it might be a little late to invest in Epic, um, mm -hmm. but also I'm not really sure what their plans are for the future. But you just look around, the, the innovation that really set them apart was this mechanic called Battle Royale, in which mm -hmm. I, I know you've mentioned your kids, my sons uh, play Fortnite too. So the the storm comes in and brings everyone together. Mm -hmm. And before that mechanic, you could put a hundred people in the same game, but they wouldn't actually see each other. 
The social interaction is so powerful, as yeah, you can exactly. imagine, in this virtual space. By instituting that mechanic, throwing 100 people in the same room, having them kill each other like the Hunger Games, and then forcing them to come closer together through that storm mechanic, they really, they hit a sweet spot. Now, every major game has a, a battle royale kind of mechanic. Even in virtual reality, I, I know you're not a huge fan of Facebook, um, but I think they're going to dominate aspects of this gaming space for better or worse, especially through VR, uh, because adding these mechanics to full body immersion really is, is a compelling experience. Um, and then you combine that with the AR, you make it integrated with your workspace. Uh, it's I, I see a brave new world of, um, of investment there in, in gaming. So you said something uh, really interesting that struck a, a chord, and that is, we're very worried about device addiction in our household and addiction to video games. And mm -hmm. there's just no getting around it. My 10 year old spends too much time playing video games, not enough time outside. And he demonstrates certain addictive traits that are really uncomfortable. Uh, and the one of the excuses, and maybe this is part of the problem we make to let him spend more time on video games is they do get a lot of the so uh, socialization. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, you hear him laughing, you hear them giving each other a hard time, and that's where a lot of these kids now socialize. Uh, uh, so I, I actually think there's some there's some good there, if you will. Also, I mean, you've seen the studies. There, for a long time, we wanted to believe the video games were led to violence, and that doesn't appear to be the case. But anyways, nope. my my son is uh, is uh, you know is is addicted. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And um, so the biggest concern I think that's valid is, is overuse, uh, displacement of healthy activities. I always yep. talk about that. Um, the other one people care about it often, especially parents, um, is the monetization of uh, attention. Of course, as you've talked about in the podcast, that's really that's really the ultimate commodity. And they use these mechanics, these Skinner box mechanics to keep you coming back, clicking, checking on your whatever uh, resources at, at whatever growth rates uh, you can change by coming back. So that that's shady. On the other side, yeah, there are great cognitive benefits to gaming, um, not just motivational kind of challenge uh, persistence. And uh, there's also the social benefits um, and, some of my research is focused on toxicity. So if you have sons, I have four sons, um, two are at video gaming age and twins under, under that. But we often talk about toxicity because there are benefits to gaming related to spatial rotation um, that increase the potential for someone to succeed in STEM fields. So young women who enter the arena of education and of gaming are potentially going to benefit by gaming, but they're also very likely when they play these online games to experience toxicity. And an argument that I've made and supported with some of my research is that um, the toxicity they encounter in gaming creates stereotypes that discourage them from playing and in a way contribute to gender disparity in STEM fields. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it, I would, so I, I encourage parents to talk to their sons about uh, not just being a bystander, being an upstander when you see someone being toxic, speaking up saying, don't be toxic to, you know, sexist or racist language. I like it. Yeah. Um, speaking of education, you your your post corona prognosis for remote education is quite bullish. Um, mm -hmm. Second only to remote healthcare, which isn't as much my thing. So I'd like to focus on education. Um, you also talk about uh, traditional academic institutions reinforcing a societal caste system. Um, and tenure being bullshit. And I am someone who has greatly benefited from this caste system. I'm protected by tenure. Um, but I, I see your argument. I like your argument. What can I do to contribute to the solution? How uh, should I teach outside of my regular responsibilities? Should I find ways to support platforms like Coursera? Um, should I get an MBA from section four? What should I do, Scott? Uh well, I think, Professor Raton, I think your decision to teach it, you're, you're at MSU, right? You're at Michigan yeah. State. So mm -hmm. just that decision right there is a step in the right direction. I think I tend to categorize all, all uh, higher ed into one group, and it's just not true. Michigan State is different than Kellogg, and that is Michigan State is still 
uh, in Michigan are still true to their mission, and that is they want to educate uh, uh, more and more Michiganers, or whatever the term is, uh, at a decent at a decent tuition. I think that they're still staying somewhat true to their mission. They, it's hard to not fall in love with exclusivity, uh, but you know my understanding is that they're spending uh, more and more time and money trying to expand access and diversity and inclusion. So I think just teaching at Michigan State versus the temptation to go more elite, if you will, and teach at a private school like USC or one of the Ivies. Uh, so I, I think th- I think the Michigan system, the University of Texas, the University of California, Cal State, uh, the University of Florida system, you know, North Carolina has an outstanding state system. I don't think they've lost the script. I think they are generally saying, okay, at some point, our admissions rates need to creep back up from 9%, which is where they are at UCLA right now, back to 60% where I was when I was applying. So I think that's the first thing. Uh, you know, you're not going to want to fight tenure because you're part of the club now, right? And and I, I would argue that if you're ever in a position to be a dean or a department chair, and this is a hard ask, but we're going to need a certain number of class traders that recognize that tenure in certain departments is really nothing but compensation that starts to pay people as many of them are about to become less productive and results in inordinate student debt. And also... Uh, dampens what I'll call innovation and competitiveness across faculties. Um, I do think tenure is required in certain fields, whether it's the humanities or law school. You know, you can you, there's just certain viewpoints there that, based on political wins, could result in that person being fired, and they need protection. I don't know enough about what you're doing, but but communications. Oh, let me say, in, in business at the business school, I think tenure is just an outdated mode. I, our, our biggest controversies are deep water versus blue water economics, gap one accounting versus gap two. We're just not saying anything that important. Well, I say it's important, but it's just not that controversial. So the notion that we need, like Galileo, to be protected from the church or whatever it was, the original <laughs> notion of tenure, it's just such a bullshit. It's a total racket. It's kissing the ass of your friends in the department and getting a bunch of citations and almost near meaningless uh, near, near meaningless circle jack, circle jerk, mutual masturbation forms of artificial relevance called academic journals that have almost no impact on the real world, except it's a racket because the guy I went to graduate school at Carnegie Mellon is now the assistant editor of the journal of you know consumer psychology, and my department's going to pay twenty five thousand dollars a year for this ridiculous publication, and then the more citations you get in these tier one academic journals that is then becomes the evaluation for whether you make tenure or not. It's just a giant it's a giant fucking racket that results in student debt. So I think we need class traders among us to say, look, job security, freedom, intellectual freedom, the 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 courage to pursue the truth is really important, but I don't think I don't think that's what tenure does. As a matter of fact, I would argue that tenured professors are some of the most spineless, cowardly people in academia right now, uh, espousing a, a, a woke dogma for fear they'll be ostracized. And as a progressive, I find that on campuses, uh, faculty have become so scared of each other being called out such that somebody can get virtue points by creating a caricature of their comments and then positioning them as, as, as you know, primeval or dangerous or whatever. So I look, I, I, I'm not, as you probably ascertained, I'm not a big fan of tenure. I think the costs of universities need to come down dramatically. I think tenure is one of many ways academics can answer the question they ask themselves every day, and that is, how do I reduce my accountability while increasing my compensation? Um, so I, I look, I, I think tenure is, is, has, is simply is just a tax on middle class households. Pure and simple. We have social services for the undereducated, food stamps, unemployment, and we have social services for the overeducated, and it's called tenure. I think it's required in some places. Uh, I think there's a, a, a huge number of just outstanding tenured professors, but the construct itself is outdated, ridiculously expensive, and there is a cost for that. Um, I work with an outstanding faculty, and I think a third of them should be put on an ice flow. I, I, I think that they are just... Uh, not very good, not very productive, but expensive. And who pays for that? Middle class households. Yeah. Wow. Hashtag real talk about academia. 
but it's always hashtag real talk with you. Last question. I only asked you for 30 minutes. I don't want to go over. Um, you always or often end your interviews with the 25 year former self question. So um, mm -hmm. 25 years former self thinking about media strategy. Um, and yeah, anything there you'd want to share or at, tell yourself? You to mean me? advice to my, my 25 year old self? Yeah. Or, or um, people who are at that age right now. Uh, so uh, I would say that I, I'm shocked at, I always assume that my kids, when I say my kids, my students are going to be more facile with social media. You really need to embrace these mediums and you can't afford, if you like video games, get totally into it, really understand the technologies. If you're, I just think you got, if you want to be in marketing or just more generally, I think if you're in the consumer world, you got to understand TikTok right now. Create a TikTok account and force yourself to post a video that gets something resembling using. You're going to start understanding it. You got to be on, you know, I used to say you have to be on Instagram, and I think that's true. I think you have to be on t Twitter. You have to be, I challenge my students to pick a medium and, and s set certain goals, whether it's followers, likes, engagement, what, whatever it is, and understand it. So if you want to have outsized influence, compensation is usually a function of influence or your ability to market your skills, you have to understand any any above market ROI on effort around influence or presence in a market is uh, full stop your ability to embrace and understand the nuance of a new medium, whether it was Kennedy and TV, Churchill and radio, President Trump and Twitter, or, you know. Zuckerberg and VR, you're gonna love that. Yeah, we'll see, yeah, we'll see, about, we'll see about that one. But ah. anyone who's able to leverage a new medium and really understand it, Elon Musk is, or was the world's wealthiest man because he really understands Twitter. He understands the power of one word, fearless tweets. Uh, and that sounds basic, but, but I would say, okay, what is your medium? Some people are great at texting. Some people understand podcasting, but, get into a new medium. I mean, really understand it and try and leverage it. Uh, it's just uh, your your excellence without leveraging it across a medium is a tree falling in a forest. So yeah, you have to be outstanding at something, develop an expertise, but you have to have a great deal of awareness in our society to be relevant and you wanna leverage, uh, figure out what your medium is. Wonderful. Uh, super informative. Scott, thank you so much, not only for being here, but uh, for being one of my educators uh, these days on this podcast. And so I think you're leveraging that medium very well. You've done an excellent job of uh, at least appealing to my sense of understanding of the world, of, of how finance works. And I think it's not just about finance and politics. I think it's really about um, what what humans do in societies. And so money is maybe a mechanism for evaluating those changes, but, um, but it's deeper, it's more philosophical. And um, I also appreciate your, even though reluctance to ascribe to the wokeness, you also are very focused on equality and uh, making an impact on society that's positive. And you also talk about being a good family member, about going to visit um, your aging uh, relatives, people you appreciate, spending time with your kids, telling them you love them, like, like all of that has been so impactful just on my my own starting of a podcast and, and my own approach to my life. So thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, I hope to talk to you again sometime in the future. I appreciate your generous words, Professor Rattan. Thanks for your good work. Absolutely. Um, hitting stop on the recording.